Hello YouTube, it's Wednesday, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, that means it's WebDM, and today we're talking NPCs in the party. You got your followers, your henchmen, your groupies, your roadies, your sycophants, your obsequient factotums. So go get your dictionary and come on back for WebDM. We talk all the time about the PCs. We sure do. And they're all hot shit, and we get that, right? Right, okay, yeah, they are. But let's let's go behind the supporting cast, as yeah. it were. What's the DM's job here with NPCs, minions, followers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anything that can support the party, right? Right, so like NPC, non-player character, um, by, by strictest definition of all, it's any character that's not one of the player characters. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. But in, in, a, in a broader sense, they are the cast of characters that the Dungeon Master is drawing on to build the scenarios that they're playing mm -hmm. um, and to create the world uh, that the party will adventure in. And specifically those NPCs that are going to be members of the party or traveling with the, the party. This show is not about villains or foils or antagonists. Right. Or the kind of NPCs that uh, that you have that are, are there to stand in opposition to your party. Right. They, we're talking about like like you said, party companions, allied NPCs. Right. All those contacts, all those all those people that are like, oh yeah, I can show you where that village is. Sure. Even down to like a mount. I don't know. Sure. A, an animal companion. An animal companion uh, yeah. for for your for your druid or your beastmaster. Where does the DM start with participation as an NPC? You're talking about like, where's the line between an allied NPC and a DMPC? Right, how can you go too far? Right, and there is a strict barrier there. Right. right. And to me, the difference mainly is, is if a dungeon master has created an NPC so that they, as both dungeon master and fellow player, have a playing piece in that party, Yeah. Uh, then they've created a DMPC for themselves. And not just an allied party member that accompanies the group, offers assistance, fills in a role that the players uh, you know, don't, can't fill in themselves. But if it's like, yeah, I'm the dungeon master for this campaign, you know, I make up all the stuff for it, I, I've created the world, I create the scenarios, and I also play a full-fledged character in that party, mm -hmm. then you've got a DMPC situation on your hands. And I think, to me, the DMPC needs to be avoided for several reasons, even though I will allow that there are situations and scenarios where, where it's appropriate to kind of kind of play one. Right. Most of the reason I, I wouldn't I don't I, I don't want a Dungeon Master PC or I advise against it is because it can lead to strong resentments from the players. Right. As a Dungeon Master, you create the world, you create the scenario, and in the context of the game, there's nothing you can't do. Yeah, you know all, you are all. You know all everything, you, you control everything. The players are bound by their characters and the rules. This is why it's like any situation which pits the dungeon master against the players is always gonna be won by the dungeon master unless they purposefully choose not to exercise their full power, right? Because it could easily just be, oh, like, we, you guys really wanna take me on and then deal with a hundred Tarasks. Just deal with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rocks fall, everybody dies. That's the joke, but it's there to reinforce the fact that the DM can put in a trap that will instantly kill you. So when you have a situation where a player has that much and then they say, oh, I'm also going to play a character in there, mm -hmm. then little doubts start to creep up. Is the Dungeon Master being completely fair? Should we trust the DM PC that's mm -hmm. in the party? And maybe party members start to resent the fact that there is a player character amongst their midst whose player has all the power and they don't. That's one, that's like the big reason why yeah. I would say, please no DMPCs. Yeah, because it, it is a little bit like in, inviting a party member that has like the cheat codes turned on. Right. But only them. Right. I mean, yeah, the DM could have them die and whatever, but. Sure, and there are situations and gaming groups and everything where the DM controlling a, a, a full-fledged character may be appropriate. If this is a new group, Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Everyone wants to play, and one person has volunteered to be the dungeon master, but they would prefer not to be. They've got a character that they love that they want to participate in the game with. For those groups, I'm gonna be less harsh. I still don't think that's a good situation to be in, yeah. mostly because it can lead to some some scenarios where people are like, yeah, I don't play role-playing games anymore because of that situation, right? But if you're playing with a group and you're new, you're starting out, this is your first campaign, you don't know if you want a dungeon master or if you want to be a player, you've got a character that you love because that's the rules that you read first, then it's hard to tell those people you should stop. But you might say you should use caution. 
yeah. when proceeding. And Restraint, so, at least. The, and the other big one to to not have a, a DMPC is because it divides your attention. There's yeah. already so much stuff as Dungeon Masters we're having to worry about. Monster stats, what all the different player characters are doing. And their combined brains are always going to be more powerful than your single brain. Right? And, and especially a single brain that's divided amongst the yeah. tasks at hand. Yeah, that's having to worry about the past, present, and future of the current campaign setting. Right. How, how all their actions are affecting those in it, you know. Yeah, and now they're going to add having to play a full party member on top of it. I'm of the opinion that if you think of a D&D campaign as a television show, then the players are the main cast. They're the ones whose names roll first on the opening scene credits. And maybe there's a guest appearance in there from an allied NPC or something like that. But everyone else in the campaign world is a supporting cast or an extra. Yeah. And if you ever are controlling a piece of that world as the DM and you find yourself starting to be a main cast member, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if your guy is the guy that's like, I'll take care of this with you my know. two dancing swords and my, yeah, yeah. No, it, please, no, that's a, that's one that I made earlier, yeah. uh, f many years ago. Uh, <laughs> and so, the other day, many years the ago. The other day, many years ago. She ended up disintegrated and then resurrected. That's a Dungeon Master player character, DMPC. Mm -hmm. Let's avoid those if at all possible. If you are in a situation where you're the DM and you wish you were playing, find someone in your group, someone in your group. If you're playing in one of these groups, and your dungeon master is playing a player character, then step up, run a game so that that player can play a character. Yeah. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, let, let, them, let them get that out of their system. <laughs> right. And then maybe bring them back around rotate the next DM, time. Rotate DMs so yeah. that everybody gets a chance to play. So, yeah. with NPCs and minions, these can be like the the, somewhat of the quest givers, mm -hmm. but they also are the contacts, right? They're right. they're the they're the people along the way that allow the party to kind of bounce through the adventure, right? Yeah, they differ from just like the NPC that your party goes and talks to for a minute. You know, they're they're going to go talk to the duke who's going to tell them about the bandits on the road, mm -hmm. and then they're done with them. Right. But perhaps the Duke sends his sergeant of arms with them. That's, you know, we're talking about that guy. Yeah. So you have, the DMs have a couple of options here. You might be including one of these because you're one of these uh, NPCs in the, in, in the game because your party consists of, like, it's very caster heavy. Nobody rolled a warrior. Yeah. And so you, they, they need a meat shield. At least party. one. At least once. A, a, a bag of hit points to soak up some of the damage that's going around so that it's not a bloodbath every time the party gets involved in a fight. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's different. Maybe you've got a party of bruisers and and they're great in combat, but when it comes to like esoteric knowledge and arcana and things like that, the party needs a sage that's never going to get their hands dirty with any of this unseemly fighting business. Mm. And it's mostly just their for the lulls in between fighting to help dispense advice that the party can go and talk to and ask them questions yeah. of. And verify that artifact they were sent to get Ver is the artifact that the they artifact, were sent to get. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so you're filling in holes uh, in, in, in the party, uh, in terms of party roles. Yeah. You can also include them because there's a, there's a skill gap somewhere. Somehow the party made it through session zero and all the character creation stuff and like, no one can pick a lock to save their life. Yeah, they, they can barely pick their nose. <laughs> they can barely pick without their nose. assistance. Yeah, so maybe there's a, an NPC that hangs out that's their B and E guy. Yeah, you know their second story man. Yeah, and and they send them in, and the player and the DM makes a single roll to see how things go, mm -hmm. and and that's it. Yeah, um, they got to go get nine fingers, and it's like, why is that? Well, he's good enough. He's good enough, <laughs> but you at, well, at least ten percent of the time he's not that good. Those are some of the reasons that they might want to. Maybe you're playing with a bunch of new players, and you're including a key. NPC to showcase a particular party or concept, right? Like that's what I've done in, in, in the home game that I'm running now. Uh, yeah. that, you know, two thirds of the group never played Dungeons and Dragons before. And so I've rotated in some like iconics that I've created. So like right now they're adventuring with a druid so that they can see this is what druids do. If you're curious about playing a druid, they can I can refer them back to this NPC and say, oh, well, you know, it's nature magic and could turn into different animals and things. And instead of telling them what the different classes can do, you can show them. Right. Page uh, 92 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is chapter four. It's an entire uh, chapter on NPCs. And it's really worthwhile to read uh, just because it gives you inspiration for creating all manner of non-player mm -hmm. characters. But on specifically on page 92, it's talking about NPC party members. 
and what to do about those uh, characters. Most surprising thing that I found is NPC party members gain a full share of experience for any adventure they participate in. Um, regardless of the level, regardless of whatever, the, the Dungeon Master's Guide says, yep, they get a full share. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's appropriate, right? Like, they are contributing, and even if the Dungeon Master is using stats from the Monster Manual uh, instead of creating a full-on race, class, background-style character, it acknowledges that the NPC is meaningfully contributing towards the success of the group, therefore they will share in the spoils. Well, as well they should. I mean, that's you don't have internships in D&D, &D usually. That's, Not anymore. You, uh, you're kind of used to. Used to, yeah, apprenticeships. <laughs> right, right. But, but, you know, you're going to have somebody going out there swinging a sword for you. They're probably going to want at least a silver a day. Exactly. That brings up, there's a whole host of, of different types. We could be talking about party family members, right? Like... People like that, lone wolf and cub, right? Yeah. Like I, I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, I want to do a samurai. That yeah, his wife died, and he goes around with his son, his his, his, his one year old son, right? Like, and he, you know, whether or not what that means, yeah, yeah. he keeps him on his back in the middle of a fight, like a barbarian, <laughs> just raging with a baby on his back. I mean, uh -huh. that's just kind of funny to me. I, I, our friends over at Encounter RP have a podcast, Turn Cloaks podcast, and one of the characters there brings their daughter. Yeah. With them on some, and again, not, it's not a good thing, right? Like she's constantly in danger, and they're always looking for a safe place to to, to put her, and and it's someone they trust to look after her while the the, the party member advances. Those kinds of. So that you might have a family member and it's a burden and it's, it adds a complication, right? Whether they're a child, a spouse, a non-combatant in general, right? Mm -hmm. Or it could be a party member that's like, this is my badass warrior sister mm -hmm. who's over here and she's going to accompany me and she's my shield maiden practically and keep me safe because I'm her younger brother and she's never, she's not going to let me get in danger, yeah. right? Yeah, um, she takes care of her brother. She takes care of it, but she's still an NPC because she's not the star of the show. Right. But she could be if your guide bites it. And that's one of the other reasons why you might want to have one of these characters in the party. Someone step right in, right? Someone's there immediately. Your character goes down in combat, nobody's got revivify, there's no healing magic. DM can just hand that sheet to a player and say, let's just get through this combat, we'll see what happens with your character. Yeah. Um, keeps them involved and participated in the fight and that kind of thing. Allies are another type of NPC party member, mm -hmm. whether it's someone that the party has persuaded through the use of skills and clever role playing to come to their side, whether it's someone that a faction has sort of said like, hey, yeah, my the the Zentarum said I gotta come with you guys. You know, yeah. I'm I'm here to to do whatever it is. Yeah, like I mean in, in my Spelljammer campaign I had a your contact in your your order, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Templeton Ledbetter. I mean he he accompanied y'all sometimes. For the most part he was just kind of a quest giver for you. Yeah. But, and a person to kind of talk to and, and, right. and seek information from. Yeah. That's another one, right? Like that comes from the criminal background that mm -hmm. I'd chosen for my character. That's a contact that I got from there. Um, the spy variant, at least. Yeah. And so, like, that's another way. Maybe a, an NPC goes from being a contact to a full-time ally. Again, because the player, like, really works hard to make sure that that NPC trusts them. There, there's so many of those henchmen, retainers, uh, hirelings are all ones. Yeah. It's like they're not close allies of the party. They, the, the party probably doesn't form emotional bonds with them uh, immediately or doesn't have an established emotional bond with them. But it could very well be that, like, yeah, we hired this sage a couple of times and... Something we hired him to do, we had to escort him there so that mm -hmm. he could read the writing that was on the ancient wall. Uh, or it's like, yeah, we hired all these torchbearers and porters and people to carry our stuff around. That's a common feature of, of old school Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, right? I was, yeah, I was going to ask. I was like, what happened to the henchmen? That used to be a, a staple, right? <laughs> it did. I it never did. really see it. You never really see it anymore. I think it switched when when the game went from being about site based exploration and treasure extraction to a tight party of heroes going on a quest. Sometime during second edition, because I know second edition included henchmen and retainers that you got as you leveled up, but I don't ever remember playing that way in second edition. Yeah. Um, so that, it could just be the way we were gaming and, and, and everyone else was out there using uh, retainers and stuff. But in old school play, you have your main character. And then you have different levels of NPCs that you ask to join you based on how much you're going to pay them. And something like a henchman might be, they might get half a share of XP and half a share of treasure, but they're going to level up with you at a slower pace. Uh, mm -hmm. My ninth, or sorry, my eighth level uh, magic user in old D&D had the same henchman from the first adventure to when I retired that character. The same, it was like a fifth level fighter by the time I <laughs> it had like all of the magic items <laughs> that I didn't want. So like magic sword and a magic shield. Dude was decked out, man. He was decked out, and his job was, he had one job. 
mm. keep me alive. Yeah. And that was it. And then I would hire uh, torchbearers and ranged combatants per the adventure. I, and after the adventure, they'd gone. I don't want to pay you anymore. Yeah. And I just hire new ones when I was like, I need some torchbearers and people to fight with, with crossbows. But my other guy, he, Corwin, he was there the whole time. And I paid him like triple because uh, he was worth it. Yeah, um, like Tyrion <laughs> says, whatever they're going to offer you, <laughs> I'll, I'll double it. I'll double it. Uh, and so it's why he was always out of money. Um, and so <laughs> Can't buy spells because he's just trying to stay alive, man. That's the, that's the bane of the, the wizard, right? This could be something that is a faction benefit for yeah. being a part of a faction, right? The Lord's Alliance, the Zentarum, um, the Order of the Gauntlet. Those are factions that have uh, mercenaries or allied soldiers that they can lend out to the party as necessary. Yeah. The, out of the Abyss, the second half of Out of the Abyss, after you finish talking to Brunor Battlehammer, is supposed to be about you leading a small army of like 80-something NPCs into the Underdark and setting up outposts and all this other stuff. So they're a part of Dungeons & Dragons history, and I like using them when I can in a campaign. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, you've just become a Thane, and now you have a House Carl who right. just wants to bitch about carrying <laughs> shit. like, oh. Fucking Lydia, <laughs> god damn it. <laughs> I am sworn to carry your sworn burdens. Sworn to carry your burdens. Maybe it's a crew of a pirate ship that you're a captain of, or, hey, part, yeah. or part of the officer class for. Yeah. Um, and and you or a spell jamming vessel that you've got a big crew for. That's where like the henchmen and hirelings come along. They tend to be low level, yeah. or at least low CR. Mm -hmm. um, don't worry too much about them. But as yeah. our spell jammer campaign shows, even if you're high level, some lobies in the party, they're eventually going to be mascots. You're gonna you're gonna like some of them. You're gonna you're form gonna, attachments. You're gonna form attachments to just them. Remember, so you better keep them alive. Yeah, I just remember that one where you had the brother and the sister who were trying to get back to their sphere. They were. And w um, I forgot which one of them died. The brother. It was the brother, but it was actually like everybody was kind of sad when y'all had a big fight and a, like orcs boarded or something, and the brother bought it. Yeah. And y'all had y'all actually had a full funeral for uh, him. We had a and, 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 uh, full, full funeral. Fu and and full then funeral. Uh, returned his uh, returned his remains back. And y'all actually dropped him off like in uh, uh -huh. uh, the message <laughs> Firefly. <laughs> yes. Where they had to like drop it off with the family, and it was all just sad and just like. And that's it. They all they were ever were were names on a paper. They were members of your, members of your crew. Guards. And you, and they, they were like CR one-fourth guards. Yeah, yeah, and y'all had trained the guy to fight, and yeah. she was, maybe she was a fighter also. I think so, um, yeah. How far should a DM go in preparing hirelings? Like, should they just be a name and a general description? Like, do you need to go any further or let the game play? Well, that's what that chapter four is so great uh, for, is it contains tables and tables and tables of beliefs and ideals and flaws and mm -hmm. and secrets and, th and and distinguishing features. You can either be inspired by what you see there and just pick what you like or mm -hmm. roll and, and sort of improv it out. And it's there because initially you don't need that much information about an NPC. You assume that every NPC at creation is an extra. They don't need a name, they don't need an anything. They're just in the background. Yeah. And then as the party interacts with them more, you have to come up, are, are they just gonna be in one scene? Then they need a name and a distinct personality trait. Yeah, they right. go from drunkard number four mm -hmm. to, to, to Carl. To, to Carl, <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Carl. Carl. Yeah. You're drinking all the boot, all the mead, Carl. And, and then if the party says, "Well, we really like Carl, and we think once he sobers up, he's really, really <laughs> he's, he's pleasant. He's, he's a hell of a ranger." Yeah. And so we uh, then he becomes an allied member. Now you need to make the decision: Do I make a character for this NPC? Do I go through the process of making a class, assigning them everything? Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. I don't recommend that. Yeah. Because the DM already has enough work, and the Monster Manual has a handy section in the back, Appendix B, where they list out uh, all different sorts of NPCs that you can use. Bolo's Guide has more. The Tome of Beasts has a bunch. Uh, and yeah. it's just it's basically like a monster that you're running. Yeah, you just pluck that stat block, a few, few abilities they mm -hmm. have, it's right there, it's easily right there. accessible. And if you need, if there's something that a class offers you that you want the NPC to have, then just drag and drop that feature from the class and go, well, this NPC has this now. Yeah. has the use of this. And if you look, that's all they did in Volos, right? Like all the NPC uh, classes in the back of Volos just look like they took, um, you know, a, a monster and said like, well, let's give them this warlock ability, this fighter ability, this monk ability, that kind of thing. That's the method that I recommend. It's fast, less work for the DM, and you can just mm -hmm. hand the players a monster manual and say, play this, play this character. 
play this one. It's my character. I get to determine what he does, what she does, how they act, what's going on, etc. But in combat, you're going to roll the dice for him. Yeah. That's what I do. Okay, so let's let's move on to uh, like animal companions, mounts, that yeah. sort of thing. You know, I mean, these are these are these are prized uh, these are prized things, right? I mean, Absolutely. Your paladin, your halfling paladin. Is gonna want <laughs> something to ride on. It's gonna want something. They're gonna want uh, some sort of uh, creature with which to do battle from. So animal companions, summoned monsters, bound creatures, that kind of thing. They're not like the traditional humanoid sort of NPC that the party may be used to interacting with. And animal companions is more than just the uh, the Beastmaster Rangers animal companion. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy Crawford uh, recently, and this is middle of January, so that's what recently had had a tweet where he was basically like. You don't need a spell, a class ability, a thing to have an animal accompany the party, right? Like, you don't need that. The animal friendship spell is an avenue for that. Um, the Beastmaster uh, Ranger Companion is an avenue for that. But in the context, it was like, how does a, how does a druid get an animal companion? Yeah. And it could just be like, well, they have an animal. It's just that they can't directly control that animal, yeah, but if you start feeding an animal, it's probably going to to follow you. Probably is, you know? yeah. Or if you do something not like in the game we're playing with with Sean mm -hmm. uh, McGovern, I saved a Triceratops from drowning <laughs> in a mudslide. Yes, you did. Actually, just because I knew it would endear you to me, because uh -huh. I actually did something seemingly altruistic. Uh huh. Yes. But it was actually very calculated yeah. You're and cold, cold blooded. Calculating Yonti and my Yonti pure blood. Yes. Uh, and you, you're overly trusting. Away from civilization a little bit too it's long. A little bit too long. Uh, druid, uh -huh. and it worked perfectly. Actually, yes. a little too perfectly. Now it's kind of gnawing at him that he actually <laughs> cares for this animal that's starting to follow him around. As the player, I'm like, I want my paladin to ride around on triceratops as I throw the crawl around because Absolutely. that's just fucking, just fucking awesome. Sweet. So those are the kinds of things, right? Like bringing guard dogs. Like this is one of those things that when I think about, like if I were to have absolute control over an adventuring party, then every adventuring party contains between three to five guard dogs. It's like, why are all these people staying up in the middle of the night to be on watch when yeah. you can just have some dogs? Yeah, right? they got like advantage. They're, they're gonna, they have advantage, they're <laughs> light sleepers. They're probably gonna smell or hear something way before you are. Yeah. Uh, why not have some of them with you? Why not have a, 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 you know, a hound master that accompanies your adventuring party that maintains the dogs and, and you know, whenever you go in to root out those kobolds or goblins, you... Come, they you strap on the spiked collars and send in, those warhounds send after. in the dogs. Send in the dogs, horses, right? And that's just like the mundane kind of creatures, right? Like I recall a time when Dungeons and Dragons, at some point, everyone had a flying mount, Pegasi and hippogriffs, yeah, and griffins, a, gr a griffin, and a wipers. giant eagle, yeah. And and so those are the other. Like, it doesn't even have to be flyers, right? It can just be fantastic mounts for your for your characters. Otherwise, axe beaks. Yeah. And dinosaurs and other kinds of, uh, of of weird creatures that exist in a Dungeons and Dragons world and would be would probably be used as mounts. Yeah, you should uh, uh, in that world. Yeah, you should write the J.K. Rowling inspired book, uh, Fantastic Mounts and How to Tame Them. <laughs> and How to Tame Them. Yes, I need to get on that. <laughs> Actually, Nerdarchy just uh, just did. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but shout out to Nerdarchy. They have a little uh, thing with uh, Fuck. some mounts from their campaign. Pruitt, it was in the idea space, and they got to it first. <laughs> That's something that you would want to have. They're not all dumb animals. And obviously, from our own real-world experience, we know that animals aren't necessarily dumb animals. Hey, and that, so it's hey a... that petition's getting more signatures all the time <laughs> right. about certain animals that have you know childlike human sentience. Right. And, and so intelligence. You, can, you can use that as a dungeon master. You can impart some kind of personality to these animals. You can yeah. ham it up. This is one of the reasons why I like watching Critical Role, because one of the characters there is a, a Beastmaster Ranger, and occasionally her bear gets to do weird, stupid, goofy things. Yeah, they get and a pot of honey to get into or something. Right, it's part of the fun. That's why I like those. And then you take that one step further, you can go like, what about permanently summoned creatures, either, whether it's through planar binding or mm -hmm. some other ritual magic, or just a monster that's like, I kind of like the cut of this party's jib. And uh, you know, and and seek to become allies mm -hmm. or, or something with them. Maybe the party so impresses an ogre as it's clearing out an orc war camp that the ogre's like, "Screw these orcs! These guys right here know how to party." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, wait, are y'all hiring? Are you guys is hiring? They're, is they're running up to the big ogre like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa time whoa, out, time hey out! Guys, I'm cheap. Hey I eat light." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, 
And so, like, maybe that is. And that's why it's important to put neutral parties in your dungeon and your adventure and, and, and just let the game and, and the course of events determine what it is and how the relationship between this neutral party and the players are going to work out. Mm -hmm. Because you might find yourself in a situation where you get a chance to really, like, dig in and role play a monstrous race as a dungeon master. Like, come up with an interesting personality for them. Um, because the party was just kind of like, you know what? We'll take it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, we could kill this ogre, or we could have this ogre watch our back. It could, yeah, and it uh, seems legit. He doesn't mind staying outside of town whenever we go back in town. Right. You know, he under, he, he he's like, listen, guys, I get it. I get it. I'm an ogre. I'm an ogre. It's okay. But he's if you'd like to take a, up over here. If you'd like to take a look at my resume, <laughs> you'll see that I come, you know. Right, I come highly recommended by all the evil warlords within the region. Mm -hmm. um, good worker. I yeah. don't show up late. I uh, work well with others. I work well with others. He's got a great monster resume. It only gets more fantastical from there. When you start bringing in things like planar binding and permanently summoned creatures, or at least creatures awakened. summoned, awakened creatures is another one. Awakened plants, right? <laughs> like you could be role playing a newly awakened sapling or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't, there's there's so many opportunities for it that I think some DMs shy away from having NPCs ally themselves with the party on a permanent or semi-permanent basis. They are still NPCs. They're supporting cast members. You're not going to play them fully. But maybe DMs are nervous. They're like, I, I've heard about DMPCs. I don't want to introduce one. Or I don't want to throw off the balance of the party by introducing a, a, a crazy kind of uh, whatever. Storm King's Thunder does this, right? Like, it's possible for a storm, or for, sorry, a frost giant in fairly early on in the campaign to ally themselves with like a fifth or sixth level party. And when you think about that, like that frost giant can cover like, was just like, well, what do you do if we've got a bunch of barbarians and fighters and, and other warrior types in there? This frost giant's gonna step on their toes. But it's up, the, up to the DM to go, well, that, I'm not gonna let that happen. The yeah. frost giant's not gonna overpower everything. Mm -hmm. But maybe the party is just like, sweet, we got a frost giant? Yeah. Like, let's let him fight and we're gonna do other things or we're gonna support this guy. So every group's gonna have to kind of work it out, but you shouldn't be afraid of like throwing really high CR allied NPCs into the party. Mm -hmm. There's ways to kind of work around it and uh, and still have a fun uh, fun adventure. Yeah, and now I can't get the image of having a Frost Giant special where you just have a Frost Giant that throws your barbarians <laughs> into combat as it's charging in. Yeah. You just have a rain. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one thing, one sort of final thing that I would add with uh, with NPCs is that if you are going to use them uh, uh, heavily in your campaigns, to I highly recommend the uh, the loyalty rule from uh, the DMG um, in chapter uh, four. There, uh, it's a great way to kind of reinforce the fact that these are independent characters. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not there to be abused by the players. They're not there to be humiliated. Uh, maybe unless they are, right? I um, mean, if you know, I'm not going to judge <laughs> if you're into that, right? Whatever kink. Uh, some goblins are pretty sadistic uh, and masochistic as well mm -hmm. and so um, but the optional rule for loyalty uh, adds a depth to them and kind of takes some of the burden of making that decision off of the DM the DM can just go hey here's the loyalty score yeah. here's how much it's got right now uh, you know you better make sure that this guy gets paid a lot next time or shown some love or exactly stop throwing things out you got you got to pay him because like you said they do like to eat so they like to masticate yes absolutely. <laughs> See how this show's gonna do. Fuck. <laughs> I feel like this is I feel like this whole day has been a critical fail. It's actually going great. I no, great. I, I think the we're doing fine. It's fine. I've just got I've just yet. I haven't worked off all my levels of exhaustion yet. <laughs> oh no, no. I, th I think we're still rocking with one. We're, I think we're, we're doing all this with I, a disadvantage. We're doing today. all of this at disadvantage. Um, because yeah. Our perform checks are at disadvantage yeah. today. Yeah. So um, we're having, this is why we're getting the help action from our director and producer. This is why we have the equipment bonus. Um, of rented gear. Of rent, uh, the gear we rented for it. Um, we're, we've got some synergy bonuses that are helping to offset it. We've got all those things. Yeah, we don't, we're not all shiny and sweaty today. <laughs>